Perfect. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all. Uh, so we are here. It is Thursday, June 15th. And I am particularly excited about today's guest. Uh, Jennifer is uh, someone who I will introduce shortly. But before I do, you have to put up with my two minutes of spiel. Uh, first off, we're now at uh, about 12,000 people in our group. Please feel free to add more. Uh, the more the merrier, as long as they are professionals, we welcome you. And obviously, uh, continuing education is what we're about. Uh, thrilled about that. Similarly, the standard thing that I would mention, um, our forum is private. These particular video sessions are public. Be advised that anything that you say on these sessions are recorded and will go out on a variety of public forums. And so please make yourself aware of those facts. Last, just as a tip before I introduce our esteemed guest, I would mention to you, just as a marriage tip, because I've now been married for 16 years, that you technically can refer to your wife as your ex-girlfriend in a public setting and not be wrong. So I'm just throwing that out there because I learned that yesterday. By the way, in every marriage, someone marries really well, and then the other person conversely marries very badly, and I'm going to let you figure out which one of that is for, for my particular relationship, given that I did that last night. Um, all right. So that being the case, I, I, I'm perfect. <laughs> I am sorry. My, my office dog is, is going a bit crazy. Um, all right. So let me introduce Jennifer, if you do not mind, please. Uh, Jennifer uh, is a partner down at Deep Williams Wall and has deep experience in the privacy field. Now, um, I'm so thrilled that Jennifer has actually agreed to speak to us today because privacy is an issue that continually comes up in our forum uh, and that agents need to deal with regularly. Uh, Jennifer is has deep experience in this. She's an award-winning lawyer in this area. I've spoken to her in the past, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say to us about this area. I could bring up her accolades, though I've posted them a couple of times on our forum. Um, most recently, and the way she came to my attention is Jennifer was recently recognized as one of the best lawyers in Canada uh, Watch on the 2003 list, um, which, and she also received the President Settler Award, which is actually very prestigious awards in the legal community. So just so you are aware, Jennifer, without further ado, it is 10.05, as I promised, I'm going to turn it over to you. And we are incredibly grateful for your time, your expertise and your willingness to actually engage our group this morning. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Although now that I hear that the kind of legal advice you're providing involves wives and ex-girlfriends, I'm not sure what I have is up to <laughs> <laughs> um, Just before I begin, if you're not on mute and you'd like to be, you might wanna just double check because I can see that one or two of you are not. Uh, as Mark has mentioned, my name is Jennifer Davidson. I am an IP tech and privacy lawyer. I spend day in, day out working on privacy issues. I am currently about shoulder deep in a, in a data breach, which I've taken some time away from to speak with you today. And I'm going to try to go through a couple of basic things that I, I think are, go are going to be important and meaningful to your daily practice. We're going to talk a little bit about copyright. I understand there's some questions about pictures and who owns what and what you can use. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about privacy and video and audio recordings and how they're a little bit different when it comes to the law. And then we'll talk a little bit about safe use of personal information. So let's start with copyright. So the basics, copyright is a creature of statute. That means it is completely independent of other laws and the rules that, that apply to copyright don't necessarily apply to even other parts of IP. Um, in, every, in every creation, every output, every work, so anything that's tangible has some copyright attached to it, as long as you've created it and put your energy into it. A photograph has copyright. The content you write for your listings has copyright. Uh, and and each, each of these, works have rights associated with it and limitations to others that are associated with it that are going to allow the creator to be able to exploit the work and have a balance with the public and their rights to use the work. So 
the way I formatted this is I, I sort of thought about what kind of questions you might have, and I'm I'm answering them in real time. Um, that being said, I'm also happy to answer your questions as they come in or at the end. Uh, so I thought that one of the first questions that you'd probably be asking is who owns copyright in the photograph? And like every lawyer question, there's a lawyer answer, and the lawyer answer is it depends. Um, traditionally, the creator of the work is the owner of the work, which would mean that the photographer is the owner of the work in the listing images that you're, you're preparing, but it's not that simple. It really depends on what the agreement you have with the photographer is. So if, if you're, and, and also the employment status of that photographer. So if the photographer is employed by the real estate agency, then you're going to end up with likely an agreement that says that all of the products of the work belong to the agency. Um, however, if you end up with a, a photographer that is a contractor, then those rights don't automatically transfer. In employment, they're more likely to transfer, but as a consultant or a contractor, they're going to stick, by default, they're going to stick with the, uh, with the creator. So you've got to make sure that your agreements with your photographer do give you rights to those photographs for the kinds of use that you're anticipating. So in this case, for commercial use, for use on platforms uh, and the like. And then, so let's talk a little bit more detailed about, sorry, is there a question? No, I think, I think it was just background noise. Okay, no problem. So what happens when you as the real estate agent uh, submit your, your photographs to platforms like MLS or on Instagram? Um, your, their, your pictures are still yours, but when you post them, you're putting, you're, you're granting the platform a license to use it. And depending on the platform, they may ask for more or less rights. And you have to agree to that license in order to be able to post. So when you look at realtor.ca, for example, their license allows them to uh, reproduce the image under license. And, uh, and, and it's actually a fairly limited license, um, but it, it's intended for the private non-commercial use of individuals, which means that if someone's going to look at your image online, they're not supposed to take it and post it themselves. And that's the limit of that license. But when you look at something like Instagram, the rights are much broader. So they've got the right to republish it, to distribute it, to modify it, uh, to perform it publicly so they can share it, create derivative works of it. Your, your derivative works, by the way, means that you can create other works from your work. Um, the, the rights are much broader, but the license ends when you take the image down. So they no longer have rights to use it after that. So what about photos taken by other agents? Well, when you have photos taken by other agents, they own the rights to the photographs and you end up in a situation where you must ask for consent before using those images. Now, I understand that everyone is aligned on you know, the understanding that we're trying to sell a property and, you know, the more, the more the merrier when it comes to publicizing, but you do need consent in order to use another, another agent's photographs or for that matter, anyone else's ownership of any work. And if you don't ask for consent, uh, you can have, so if someone came to me as a lawyer and asked me to, you know, what do I do? Somebody's using my picture. You can go onto the platform. You can ask the, the platform to step in and take down the image. The individual will get a notice and repeat violations can end up with user accounts getting deactivated. And also you can end up with a request from the, the owner to, uh, to make payment because you've used an image that they've got rights to. So they're well within their rights to, to demand such a thing. Now, when it comes to pulling information off of MLS, off of other listing sites, um, th there's something called web scraping. That, and that's a term we use for taking data off of pages and, and using them for other purposes. Uh, there are rules on almost every single website against web scraping, and it's also a violation of copyright, as you can imagine. So. Uh, I pulled the, the realtor.ca terms. I know, fun and interesting to go through the terms of use, but this is where it is. 
And, and pretty much every single terms of use is similar, saying that they prohibit screen scraping, data, database scraping. And there's a lot of case law that sits around this kind of work and making sure that you do not, uh, that you do not try and scrape information for other uses. Uh, there's a couple of recent cases. Well, the government, we said, look, this is how consumers refer to us as. They call us real estate agents and realtors. Uh, Why can't we amend the code of ethics that someone else is so that we can refer to yeah, ourselves second, please. Sorry. in the way? That's okay. It sounded like a better talk than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. I, I, will, I will keep monitoring. I'm sorry about this. Not at all, not at all. I like conversations. So if you wanted, if, if you've got questions, you'd like to ask something, please do pop in. If anyone uh, has any, if anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat and I'll interrupt and I'll post them to Jennifer, okay? Sounds great. So uh, 2019 Federal Court of Canada had a case with, uh, with Trev and the MLS and they issued a permanent injunction against the website operators. In this case, they were called Monkhouse, uh, Monk has Realty or something similar, and uh, they, they stopped them from taking the data off of MLS and putting it on their own site. There's also something called technical protection measures, and this is a big one when it comes to copyright. So where you put up a paywall, where you put up any sort of technical barrier between the information and the people who access the information, uh, where you pull information by avoiding that, what we call a TPM, you're, you end up with a, a copyright infringement that does not allow you to make use of any of the defenses that we tend to try to use under fair dealing and other things because you can't go around the paywall. So one of the things to keep in mind is if there is a technical protection measure in place, you want to make sure that you're not violating it. And this was one of the things in the Mongo has case where uh, they were they were going around the TPMs in order to try and scrape the data. So taking this a bit further, you're using the image, you've got rights to the image, you're using the image, there's still another thing to consider and that's the buyer and seller rights. And for this, we end up going back to the Real Estate Council of Ontario for their guidance and we, we look at when I need when you need to pull when you need to pull those images down. When do your rights expire, essentially? And when the home's listed for sale, you're under agreement with the seller, and you have the rights to to publish the information. They're trying to sell their home. You're trying to publicize and market that. So you've got the rights. However, once that home sells, those rights begin to transfer. And when the home actually changes hands, those rights expire at least for the, from the seller's perspective. So you're allowed to run those images until the ownership changes hands. If you wanted to use those images afterwards, you need to have the buyer's consent. Uh, and if you're trying to, um, to use pertinent details like selling price or closing date, uh, then permission from both buyer and seller are needed. So, I always put these slides up because people only pay attention when they wonder what the penalties can be. So with copyright, when you're talking about commercial use, which we are when we're talking about using images in a real estate context, you're looking at between $500 and $20,000 for all infringements involved in the work. If there's multiple works, we're looking at multiple infringements. So you can see how those dollars add up. Under copyright law, we have something called statutory damages and that essentially means that you don't have to prove the damage, the cost to the, the impairment to the individual that owns the work in order to receive a judgment. So you want to be quite careful. In very large violation cases, there are uh, there's an opportunity for exemplary damages and uh, and you can go up to criminal penalties and looking at one million dollar fines and imprisonment. These are rare. So how do you reduce your risk of infringement? Check your agreements. Make sure you've got the right agreements with your photographer, right agreements with the buyer and seller. Make sure you understand your rights when it comes to the access and use of those images. 
check your images regularly. Make sure that you're taking down images when houses sell and that you're not keeping things up online past the point where you're allowed to do so. Determine how you wish to use the, the photographs before you take the photographs so that you can uh, assign those rights accordingly. And keep records. So you have consent from a buyer or seller, you have an agreement with the photographer, keep records of it so that it doesn't come back to haunt you later. So now let's get into a little bit about privacy law. Can I, can I stop for one second, Jennifer? We of do course. have a question. Um, Jane has asked, so do we need to remove social media advertising for listings once sold? If those listings include information about the, include photographs, include personal information or identifiable information when it comes to the buyers and sellers, then yes, as it changes hands, those rights expire for you. There is a slide coming up that actually speaks to that exact thing. And I'm going to get back to that if you don't mind. No problem. So the basics of privacy law. We have a federal law in Canada. We call it PIPIDA or PIPIDA. It's the Personal Information Protection and Electronics Document Act. This covers us federally across Canada. It's our privacy law, but we have a complex web of privacy law in Canada and where a province has a privacy law that is deemed similar, substantially similar to PIPIDA, the province will follow the privacy law within that province. So within Quebec, within Alberta, within BC, we have substantially similar privacy laws, which means within those jurisdictions, you have to follow the Quebec privacy law if you're dealing with Quebec residents, Alberta, BC, et cetera. So the provincial law takes over from the federal law, but what we're seeing is across the board, there's a lot of similarity between the privacy laws. There are some nuanced differences, particularly in Quebec, uh, but when we look at personal information privacy protection, one of the things that we're looking primarily for is making sure that we're always seeking consent where the cons where where you're using personal information and that we're always being cautious of the broad general rules that are are definitely in effect throughout um, but something to think about if you're if you're in Ontario and you're marketing to people in Quebec then the Quebec privacy law applies to you because you're dealing with people from Quebec even though you're in Ontario so it's a little bit nuanced, but one of the things that you do want to keep in mind. Um, you've also got the Real Estate uh, Business Brokers Act, uh, which is a provincial legislation that regulates the real estate transactions and salespeople in, involved in the industry. And there's also the CRTC, uh, which provides rules and regulations about when you can call people and contact people and how, how those transpire. So we're going to jump into each of those. So the question was asked, you know, what happens with video recordings and, and particularly in open houses, but really whenever there's a walkthrough, what are the rights of the buyers, the prospective buyers and the sellers? So it's, this, is, this became a really interesting project for me to dive into a little bit. Um, when we're looking at sellers and their rights, they have the rights to keep cameras in their homes. They've got the rights to record for, for safety, for the protection of property. So they've got absolute rights to be able to have and record video footage within their home. And they don't have to disclose that they have those cameras. So one of the things that you do wanna keep an eye out for is you know, making sure that your, your clients understand that they could be recorded. And you know, it, it, these things can give an inside view as to a prospective buyer's position, which the prospective buyer may not want. Say they absolutely love the house and will buy it at any price. That's not necessarily information you want the seller to know. But these rights don't follow through for the prospective buyers. So question, can, can a prospective buyer video, take pictures within a, a a seller's property? No, not without consent. They don't have the right to take those pictures without asking for consent. So another thing to keep in mind.
So how do you actually protect against this? Well, there's a number of different ways that I'm sure you're, you're likely already using, um, but really posting signs is, is one of the easiest ways that you can assure the security of the seller's home. Prohibit specific conduct. Say that you can't take unauthorized photos or videos. There's a reason why listing agents put videos up, images up online. All of these things are there so that the individuals don't have to take these images and they have the resources available to show their mom the home that the home of their dreams. Now, one thing that I found really interesting when I was looking at this was the difference between a video recording and an audio recording. So video can be deemed necessary for the safety and security of your home. And that's, that's a right that we understand and we're granted. Audio rights don't necessarily follow that. So when it comes to audio rights, if you're gonna record someone, at least one person within that conversation needs to consent to having that recorded. So if you're talking to one other person in the room, I'm talking to Mark and I'm recording, well, I have, I, I've given consent to that recording. Now, Mark and I are in a little bit of a different boat actually, because with lawyers, you cannot do that. So, but with, with individuals, as long as one individual has consented to it, you can record. What does this really mean in application? So we've got these hidden cameras all around the house. They're not just collecting video, they're collecting video and audio. That makes for a very confusing scenario for a court. Um, video is okay, audio is not. So the only real way that you can avoid this in a clear way is to post that you've actually got cameras and our video and audio recording when you walk through the house. Um, that's one way of getting through this, but I noticed that a lot, a lot of people do not do so. So what are some of the do's and don'ts? So do get sign-in sheets, get consent forms, state the purpose of collecting the personal information so that you have that express consent uh, whenever you're collecting information, you do want to share why you're collecting it, what you're using it for, how you're using it, who you'll share it with. There, there's, there's a clear set of information that you should be providing to individuals when you're asking for consent to collect their personal information. But on the other side, when you explain what you're using, the in, what rights the individual has when they're in the home, you're giving the notice that's necessary in order to be able to control the environment a bit more. Um, on the don't side, don't use the visitor's personal information for any other purpose than you've, had, than you've asked for when you've asked to collect it. Um, don't take pictures without asking for the seller for permission. And then we can get into a little bit about the safe use of personal information. But just before I jump over there, were there any questions on that last piece on the privacy front and open houses? Uh, Jeff asks, what if a camera and recording device is in clear view, like a doorbell camera? So you have the right to have a doorbell camera. You have the right to record on your property. There has been some case law that says that you've got the right to record on your property, but you don't have the right to record the street outside your property. It, it's, it's, th there's a limit to how much you can officially take, but you've got the right to keep your camera for safety and security. I have my camera up in, in front of my house and it, it is something that I feel very comfortable with having there and deem necessary for my safety and security. In such a case where you have a doorbell cam, that is clearly viewable and you can clearly see that there's a camera, that's notice, in my opinion. That is notice that you you are recording the, the individual on the device. You, you wanna go a step further, you can post you know, uh, a, a sign that says we are recording, but you, are, you have the rights within your own home to be able to do so. Excellent, thank you. My pleasure. So safe use of personal information. So April 1st, 2023, uh, 
the uh, there was a new the Ontario government introduced new measures to in, in, improve transparency and they created the open offer process which allows home sellers to share bids on their property so that you can share information. Now, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, so I won't go into it in great detail, but I thought that it was a very interesting piece when we're sitting here talking about privacy and what rights you have to share and not share, you end up with a situation where the Ontario government is actually working to increase transparency in this space. And you'd asked before about, about advertising the sale. So there's a number of different layers to this, and we're going to get into it just a little bit. But um, on, on the REBA code, so this is the Real Estate, uh, Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, uh, which governs those trading in real estate in Ontario. Uh, the registrant shall not do anything in an advertisement that could reasonably be used to identify specific real estate unless the owner of the real estate has consented in writing. And the registrant shall not include anything in an advertisement that could reasonably use to identify an individual, uh, again, without, the, without consent. So, so these things are, are, are rather laid out for you in terms of making sure you've got that consent in writing and you're keeping records of it. Uh, and then when advertising that a property is sold, you can't include an image and text that would identify the parties to the transaction unless they've consented. Um, that identify a specific property, so you can't use the address without the, the owner's consent, and uh, determining the contents of the agreement relating to the transaction uh, includes the provision that relates to price and a price or term. So any of those details you can't share as well, uh, which you know I, I see this in common practice where it, they use a percent, you know, 25% above asking, that sort of a thing as opposed to using the actual list price. So this is the table that I wanted to get to. And this is this all comes from uh, REBA's Code of Ethics. And we're, we're really looking at what happens before the sale versus what happens after the sale. So I thought this was a really handy way of looking at it. So if the seller wants to advertise that the property is sold, before the transaction, you need the seller's consent. After the transaction, you need the buyer's consent. Um, where you want to advertise, you know, with an image of the property, there's, you know, consent of both is required. Uh, buyer's brokerage wants to advertise the property is sold. So before you've got the seller's permission, after you've got the buyer's permission. So this is one of the things that, you know, I've, I've been asked this question and how do we get around it? And the method that I think might work best in this scenario, although I, I haven't spoken to real estate lawyers to see what is actually being done in practice, but if a consent waiver can be signed at the time of, uh, at the time of sale by both buyer and seller, uh, then you have those rights packaged in. And if you can get them both at the same time, then you've got those rights to continue through and to continue using those images to advertise that the house was sold and other uses that are clearly displayed within a, a consent waiver. So getting into the CRTC, and, and, and I think that this is, is probably fairly widely known as well. Um, you've got the do not call list, which uh, allows, allows individuals who don't wanna receive telemarketing calls to add their number to a centralized list. You cannot call that list. It becomes relevant for brokerages or agents who want to contact individuals as part of an advertising or marketing campaign. Um, you know, typically speaking, I, I used to get calls. Now these days, I end up getting letters in the mail. And I think that that's one of the, the do not call list is one of the reasons for that. What happens if you violate? So again, my penalties page. <laughs> Uh, so the Chief Compliance and Enforcement Officer of the CRTC issued $100,000 in penalties against several real estate investments and mortgage agencies and brokers back in 2020. Uh, they had hired a telemarketing firm to recruit prospective clients, and that did not abide by the CRTC's unsolicited telecommunication rules. So th there, there are penalties involved, they are real, and they do get issued. Now let's talk about email. 
so we've got something that we, we've got a legislation that we typically call Castle, which is the Canadian anti spam legislation. And this regulates who you can send messages to and how you can send messages. So the basic you know, jargon is that this is a commercial electronic message. What does that mean? That means direct messages on social plat social media platforms, that means emails, that means text messages. Any electronic message that's sent for a commercial purpose falls within the scope of Castle. So it's a pretty wide scope and it's something to keep in mind when you're starting to connect with clients if you've got if you've got those rights and and how you're using those rights and whether you're following all the forms that are mandated by government. So if you if you've been contacted by a by an individual, say you've been contacted by a couple and they're interested in in working with you, you have the right to get back in touch with them. However, assuming that they don't sign and they move on with their lives, that right is called an implied right and that it all, it expires after six months. Now, if they've worked with you and they've hired you, you've worked with them, that implied right, assuming you don't get an express consent, will last for two years after the transaction. So these are kind of nuanced details, but what I'm trying to get at here is that consent, the consent piece is critical to all of it. And if you can get consent from an individual, that consent is not going to expire. It can be withdrawn, but it's not going to expire. So it gives you more rights to be able to contact the individual, sell, tell them about new properties, um, you know, inform them about what's going on in their neighborhood, you know, in case they're interested in, in moving up or moving out. Uh, one of the things you want to just keep aware of is what those rules are and how to and how to put them into play. So that's the next slide. There's there's three key features of this that I want you to take away. Uh, if you're sending out CEMs, and I'm, and frankly we're all sending out CEMs, obtain consent, keep a log of the consent. So this is again that record keeping piece. You want to make sure you're keeping it keeping track of of the consent you're receiving, when you received it, how you received it, and, and keep that within a log. If you've got a CRM, those things are very good for making sure that you're keeping those logs. Uh, and if you're sending out you know, mass messages, marketing messages, you're gonna wanna keep a live list because people can withdraw their consent at any time. And once they withdraw the consent, you have to take them off the list. So keeping this, this back channel managed is going to be a critical piece in order to make sure you're not violating the CASA laws. Um, when you're sending out those marketing messages, there are, there are certain forms that they need to take. You need to provide your identification and information, how they can reach you, uh, and you need to provide an unsubscribe mechanism. And the unsubscribe mechanism has to work, just a key piece. Safe handling of personal information. So I recognize that you know, cyber is not front of mind for most people, but data breaches happen and they happen to all types of organizations and real estate is not excluded. So protecting your information and protecting the information of the individuals who share their personal information with you is critical. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about some safe handling tips. Um, you want to make sure you're mindful of disclosing to the client or customer, uh, to anyone who's not associated with the listing or selling the property. You want to you want to be careful that you're making sure that you are getting collection getting consent for the collection of their information, and you've got to be careful to control that information and how you and how you're using that information. So if I'm collecting addresses from people or contact information from people who are visiting an open house, I have limited rights to do to use that information to send them messages in the future. Those rights are limited to the rights that I request at the time of collection of the information. So if I write down, you know, I'm collecting your personal information so I can contact you with with commercial marketing messages, then you've, you've stated that clearly. If they want to provide you with that information, they want to give you that consent, then, then they can. If not, they can choose not to. Um, but you want to be clear and, and straightforward when you're asking for that kind of consent.
you want to be careful about how you're using the information. And, and this is this is one that it's again rather nuanced, but it, it's quite important. So when we look at personal information, we typically don't think about things like a business email address as personal information. It's business information. But uh, the privacy commissioner disagrees and says that the business that business contact information can be considered personal information. So we have to be very cautious about all emails that we're using and consider them all part of the larger scheme of personal information that we need to protect. Um, and, and so even with a person's email, business email address, you want to be careful of, about sending them commercial electronic messages without gathering consent. Tip number three, uh, don't, include, don't disclose information about individuals, buyers or sellers uh, for anything other than what is related to the listing. Seems like common sense. Um, but important to mention. So you only have the rights to use the information for the purposes that you have requested. Again, if you don't have the rights to use it, you cannot go ahead with it. So how do you keep this information safe? What are your responsibilities? And, and I do take this rather seriously. This is your responsibility to, to do, even if you, you're your agency is not going forward and, and, and proactively doing this. It is the individual who is collecting the information, unless you're collecting it on behalf of, say, Remax, you, you're collecting the information. You are the owner of that, that you are the custodian of that information. Sorry, I'll use the correct terminology. And if that individual's personal information is leaked, you are on the hook. So it is your responsibility to make sure you've got the safe handling practices. So you've got to take the right physical protection measures, which includes storing personal information in locked offices and drawers, you know, clean desk policies, making sure you're not keeping information where others can see them. Um, it's your responsibility to protect that data against loss or theft. So keeping it in safeguarded environments. So when we talk about things like uh, physical security. We also talk about things like security in the cloud. Are you encrypting? Are you password protecting? Are you making sure that this information is protected to the best of your ability? And you want to make sure that equally you're protecting your devices. So your phone, your laptop, your iPad, they should all, they just should all be locked and, and you should not leave them unattended. If there is a breach, you also have responsibilities to report those breaches. Uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit more at the end. But right now, I, I think the idea that I really would like to convey here is that you should be implementing office measures that protect the safety of personal information across the board. Cybersecurity. So again, may not be top of mind for you, but believe me, it would be top of mind if you're in the middle of a data breach. Uh, and I've dealt with many, many of these. And it's always you know, individuals or organizations with the best of intentions and someone who exploits that. So the, if you take a look on the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, they've got a great website with a whole lot of tips and tricks about how to make sure that you're protecting information. It's important that you check that and it's important that your practices are consistent with that because you want to make sure that if there is a data breach, you can you can say that you've been doing everything right. You've been doing everything you can in order to protect the information. Uh, so things like developing an instance response plan. Uh, again, I know that many organizations don't have this, but taking the time to think out what you would do and what you need to do and what your professional and legal responsibilities are if there is a data leak saves you saves you a great magnitude of time. It gives you the opportunity to plug and play what you need to do when it happens because that's not the time where you wanna start reading the book and figuring out what it is that you need to do. So having these incident plans in place ahead of time is really, it, it's a time saver, not a time waste. Uh, and Really, you want to make sure you're going back and checking it and, and updating it on a regular basis as well. These things should not be sitting and gathering dust on the shelves. Um, 
When it comes to safety and security of your, inf or your network infrastructure, you wanna make sure that patches are, are being implemented in a timely manner. Now I get that that's usually the IT group, but you wanna make sure that those practices are, are up to date and, on, and that you've got SLAs that'll protect the information. So, sorry, SLAs are service level agreements. So if you have an IT team that's an outsourced IT team, you wanna make sure that you've got a commitment from them to update and patch your, uh, your critical infrastructure on a timely basis. Uh, adding things like multi-factor authentication, these are standard now. So you want to make sure that if you've got the ability to add those things in, you are uh, you're you're implementing them as quickly as you can. Configuring your services. So I, I mean, without getting into great detail here, we see a lot of problems here. You get the best firewall in the world, but it's not configured properly. So having that extra chat and the, the time to talk to someone who is familiar with the technical the technical security in your organization really does make a difference and making sure you've got really good help there is, is a critical of critical nature. Um, good password hygiene, making sure that you're changing your passwords regularly, that your password isn't password one, two, three. It, it, it really does make a difference. So checking those passwords, keeping a password keeper, making sure that you're using every available protection in order to safeguard your data is, is vital. Um, you want to make sure you're backing up uh, and encrypting your, your data. One of the reasons why I suggest this is in the event of a data breach, in the event of a cyber attack, if your data is taken, you want to be able to restore and you want to be able to get back to work. And that's, your, that's, that's one of your key priorities. Having good backups is what's going to get you there. So... Again, going back to the Canadian Center of Cybersecurity, a couple of things that they recommend, securing your cloud and your outsource IT services, securing your websites, implementing access control and authorization, and securing portable media. Now, when it comes to your day-to-day -day communications, a few things that you can do there as well. Uh, encrypting your emails when they contain sensitive or confidential information putting passwords on sensitive documents and having the right safeguards in place so that you have a plan for what steps might need to be taken. Um, especially if there's a cyber breach, you wanna make sure that you are taking all preventative measures and you're ready in case you need to have a response. So a few key takeaways. Reviewing agreements are critical. We, you know, we tend to take a quick look and scan and sign, uh, particularly where we're busy people and we've got a lot to go. But it's really worth taking the time to just have a look at what rights you're being given in, in the context of copyright and in the context of privacy. But you got to understand the chain of ownership for copyright so that you understand what license, what license rights you actually have. Um, when it comes to buyers and sellers, there's different rights when it comes to what you can video record, what you can audio record, and it also changes from the perspective of the buyer and the seller. And then the third thing to take away is check your safe handling practices when it comes to personal information. Um, you know, it, it's it's easy to overlook this in the day-to-day -day business, but when there is a critical incident, these things can end up uh, with enormous magnitudes of, of uh, difficulty and issue and grief that is unnecessary if you can just take the proper practices to begin with. So with that in mind, I'd like to open it up to questions. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. I can't thank you, first of all, just before we get to questions, I can't thank you enough. This has answered so many questions that people ask me and I don't know the answers to that I do now. So I'm incredibly grateful. I'm gonna just call on people to address the questions that they've put in the chat, if you don't mind, so that we can have a sort of actual dialogue. Um, and maybe I can start, if you don't mind, with Omer. Uh, Omer, if you'd like to ask uh, your question, please feel free, and then we'll turn to Brenda right after. I think he's just unmuting, hopefully. He's there. Yep, there he is. Hey I like there. The, build up. the build up is good. 
When you walk into a home to show a property, should you make an announcement as you walk into the home that you don't consent to any audio recording? Um, you, you can scream it from the rooftop, but I'm not sure it's going to do what you want it to do. Uh, well, you said it's one person. One party and needs to consent. And if the other party is consenting to it, you don't necessarily need to consent. Now, there would be a, a large issue if that was brought in front of the court and you had said on the audio recording, I do not consent to the audio recording. Uh, but the, the rules are, are, are fairly limited in this manner. If you're having a conversation with one other individual and that other individual has consented to the recording, even the fact that you are unaware or that you don't consent, it, it doesn't prohibit the recording. But you want to be cautious that they don't necessarily have the rights to record and it's a bit of a gray area. So if someone said that to me and I don't, I, I don't consent to you recording my audio, it would be pretty clear to me that I'd be shutting it off on a basic level because I'm not going to want to go down the road of litigation over an audio recording. Uh, however, the rights of the individual to have things recorded, if they've consented to it, they, they operate against that. But if they put a microphone in there and they're not there, so then they're not there to consent. And you're walking in to show a property where the owner's not home, but he's got a mic in there. That's true. And if they're not home and they're not there, then they don't have, and they're not in conversation with you, which is really the critical piece there, then audio should not be recorded. So that's when I would ask, is it proper to announce that you don't consent from your end? It's it's proper for you to be able to say so. Uh, mm -hmm. The question of how it, it plays out in practice is a little bit muddier, but the 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 part that sort of gets me is, what happens when it's inextricable, the video and the audio? You know, you've got a little ring cam in the corner and, and you're not letting people know that. You've got the rights to the video, but not the audio, but they're inextricable. So how do you how does that actually play out? And I don't think that that's actually been brought in front of a court in order to give us that kind of clarity. Or when we get confirmation on an appointment to show a property, maybe we should respond back that we're not giving consent to be audio recorded in the property. Give them advance notice. That's always my preference. Put it up front, give them notice, give the opportunity for them to decline. They can turn around and say, we don't want you in the home. Fine, <laughs> you know, if that's, if that's how they wanna handle it. But much more likely they're gonna say, okay, we agree, we understand these are your terms and, and we're going to consent to, you know, not having the camera plugged in at the time that you come through the home. Personally, I don't mind if there's video recording going on, but I do mind when there's audio because you wanna be able to talk to your client. Yeah, I, I agree and I appreciate that. I think that there's a lot of conversations that happen in the midst of a, a walkthrough that you don't necessarily want the sellers to know. Thank you. All right, Brenda, let's turn over to you. So just a question that came up when you were talking about using a business email address um, and that it could be um, considered personal use. But what about real estate salespeople who are promoting their listings, say, to another salesperson using their business address. Is that allowed without consent? Because it happens all the time. So these are commercial electronic messages and you should have a castle consent in order to be able to send those messages. Uh, the uh, individuals who receive these messages have the rights to make complaints. And, and frankly, they do make complaints to the CRTC and the CRTC takes action on it. We've, we've seen a number of such cases. So you want to make sure that anyone's, anyone who's on your list to send these marketing messages to has delivered you consent in writing. So we want it express that, that you can send these messages to them. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to go back to, I, I didn't really quite understand Francisco's question. Francisco, do you feel that the question has been answered at this point or do you, oh, you've said that it has, okay. Uh, no, 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 it hasn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it hasn't been. So why don't you ask Jennifer directly then? Uh, Jennifer, my question is, I see there's real estate YouTube videos on selling a property and you see them on YouTube for years after the sale of the property. Now you mentioned if you have consent of the seller at that time makes sense, 
but those videos are like evergreen. Is they, are they in breach basically of that uh, because they don't have consent of the new buyer? If they don't have the consent of the buyer, then they shouldn't be, they shouldn't have that video posted after the time that the home has changed hands. And that's, that's a RICO rule. That's very clear for, it's implemented in real estate for the protection of real estate and for the protection of, of the personal information of the buyer and the seller. That it should come down unless you have the buyer's uh, consent to keep it up. And the other question is about email spoofing. How do we protect ourselves in the privacy field? Because I recently got an email and Gmail is saying your email address may be spoofed. It's an email for me and I don't know how has it come to me. So, so is there anything in the privacy domain that we could protect ourselves with that or? Um, there's a long answer and a short answer. The long answer is you need to have me back for another hour to talk about that one. Um, the short answer is that you want to do everything you can to protect against that kind of spoofing. And when you find out that that kind of spoofing is, is there, you want to do what you can to change your passwords. You want to make sure that you're protecting and, and protecting other individuals. So if, they're, if you're using a common address, it's much more likely to be spoofed. So if I'm doing, you know, sales at realestate.com, somebody's going to figure out that address and do their very best to get in there. Um, you can't really stop spoofing. You can't. I mean, when they're coming from a different organization, uh, but if they're contacting your individuals, if they somehow have access to your list of contacts, you want to be getting in front of that and proactively letting others know that you have been spoofed and that you wouldn't be asking for personal information. You're not you're not calling from a, a street corner, you know, with a need for ten thousand dollars to be wired to you immediately. Um, you're not going to ask for the collection of their personal information via email, those kinds of things. You want to make sure that you're in front of that and you're letting uh, letting individuals know that if, if they're contacted, it, it, it's not you. Thank you. Did anyone else cut out? Sorry. Jennifer, are uh, you yeah. still there? Yeah, yeah, Mark, I had a quick question. Yes, go ahead, Arthur. Okay, well, so the question is regarding lease uh, documents. Uh, let's say I represent tenant and I send complete application with his IDs and everything else to the other agent and agent claiming that he's going to review it with his clients. How does he protect my client's information? Some may have uh, sensitive stuff like a pay stub and everything else. Is he allowed to forward to his clients or he must review it on his own? keep it uh, restricted and just uh, talk to his clients, but not forward them uh, all the information, how this is even protected. So if, if I understand you correctly, I think what you're asking, and I just want to repeat this back to you to make sure I understand, um, where you're sharing information about a, a potential buyer, pay stubs, identification, that sort of thing, what is the, what is the limitation of rights for the seller's agent in terms of sharing that information forward. Is that correct? Yes, yes. This is more in regards of tenancy and lease, but you're right. Uh, I'm forwarding my client's application to the other side and the other side needs to review it with his clients. And I have no visibility how they review it, either verbally or actually forwarding the entire documentation package, which includes a lot of sensitive information. Well, I imagine that the code of ethics speaks to that, um, although I haven't read up on it to be able to tell you what the exact provision might say. Uh, however, I think that whenever you're giving information, whenever you're sharing information, it, it's important to be clear the limitations of that share. So I am disclosing mm -hmm. my personal information to you for the purposes of verification of my, you know, my, my purchase. Uh, and this can only be disclosed to, and that you give you give a limitation as to who this can be disclosed to. This can only be ex ex uh, exposed to the agent and should not be shared further. If they share further, if they share with the uh, with the sellers, then they're in violation of those terms. So you want to be very cautious to stipulate and be very clear on what those terms and limitations of those terms are when you're sharing information. Uh, however, if I'm sharing information to the seller for the purpose of verifying my ability to purchase this home, 
I'm sharing it to the seller. Uh, the agent of the seller is just the agent of the seller. I, I, I'm actually doing right. this for the purpose of sharing with the seller in that case. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the difference that I'm trying to make here. Um, it really depends on what the purposes are and what's been explained and what the, the limitations of those consents are. Again, we are in an environment where we get to make the rules by, by having agreements. So that's what agreements are for. They're supposed to set the limitations to the rights. And if we use those to our advantage, we're able to control the information flow a lot better. Okay, Jennifer, thank you. Before I thank you, as we're near we're approaching the end of our, um, I just want to mention to the group, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, Jennifer, but this is our area. Um, Rico uh, Reba is currently being trained to TRESA, um, and it's undergoing amendments both to our code of ethics uh, and to, of course, uh, the brokerage law. Um, while uh, Jennifer was speaking, I because this is an area in flux, I just want to point out that I see no amendments to the advertising provisions. And thus, it appears as if for those of you who are asking, a couple of people have asked me privately, yes, this applies to Tressa as much as it does Reba unless you hear otherwise. So I see nothing in here that actually is altering those advertising rules. And I just want to point that out because there were a couple of private questions on that. Uh, Brian, unless you know, Brian Madigan's here. Brian, maybe you know otherwise, but I, I think it's safe to say that that this the law, as it's stated, will continue through the Code of Ethics. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Uh, so it should uh, it should certainly uh, continue. There's yeah, no question about that. Okay. Uh, so Jennifer, with your permission, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to point out to everyone here, there's constant need for privacy lawyers and no one really knows who to recommend. There is a reason that people specialize in areas of law. It's not just that people are trying to find a niche and it's easier to build a book of business, but rather it is that there is a body of law and knowledge of it takes years and years and years to assemble until you're able to answer as Jennifer does with a fluency that's born of experience. Uh, Jennifer, that was very evident to us today in the way you talked, in what you presented to, you have made my life immeasurably easier as I now have answers to questions I did not know before this session. I'm incredibly grateful. We are all incredibly grateful. We will put this up and I will send you a copy of the video. But from now, please sincerely thank you from all of us. Uh, this has been a very meaningful, informative, and above all, useful presentation for all of us uh, in our professional lives. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it, and it's a great group. Thank, thank you so much, Jennifer. Guys, have a wonderful one.